Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Trickle down, shakedown in the toll booth economy. Let's talk with Stacy Herbert. Yes, Max. <laughs> We're seeing financial crimes all over the place, right? Well, the feds have apparently acted. They are able to act. Six charged in federal crackdown on hacking by anonymous and lull sex groups. So, Sabu, we know, a, a, a LulzSec member, admitted to hacking Sony and also the computer system used by Fox Broadcasting Company, Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, according to U.S. authorities. So Sabu and these other defendants face as much as 122 and a half years in prison, according to the judge involved in this case. Yeah, well, what about the hackers uh, who hacked into MF Global accounts? What, what about the hackers that hacked into the LIBOR uh, business, multi-hundred trillion dollar business they hacked into? What about Goldman Sachs? They hacked into Greece, destabilized that country. Where are the penalties for these people? Exactly, because all these guys are charged with, in all, most of these cases, in the Sony and Fox case, that they just basically took down the site and they took some email addresses and passwords. Okay, that's the extent of it. Now, Sabu, got involved with the feds, the FBI, and with them, apparently, it looks like from the timeline that they, in fact, hacked Stratfor. And then the feds encouraged them to use the credit card information they stole and use that to purchase $700,000 on these credit cards. So that is a financial crime, but it's $700,000. Where are the same thing? Where is Rupert Murdoch in jail? Why isn't he facing 122 years? Because according to U.S. Attorney Pre. Barahar said in a statement, the six defendants and their unidentified co-conspirators waged a deliberate campaign of online destruction, intimidation, and criminality. As you and I covered in our episode about the data industrial complex, this is exactly what Rupert Murdoch's enterprise does. Okay, the LIBOR hackers, they, they, they're going to seek a remedy where they have to give back the money they stole. That's it. The profits they made. Okay, so here you have th this hacker group. Apparently, they uh, were responsible for missing seven hundred seventy thousand dollars. So the penalty should be they give it back, right? Exactly. All they profited from it. Okay, so where's the double standard here? The double standard is because the Hollywood industry, the MPAA, the RIAA, they have millions, hundreds of millions of dollars at work for lobbyists in Washington. The Consumer Protection Bureau, the Consumer Protection Lobby is protecting people from predatory bankers don't have any money at work in Washington. So you, cle you see really clear how the, the laws are written by the lobbyists. These people who are for the copyright cartel, they write the laws that put this guy in prison for 100 years, 120 years. The people who hack into LIBOR, Goldman Sachs, hacking into Greece, uh, MF Global being hacked into by JP Morgan. Uh, those laws, are they write them laws for themselves where they simply get paid, maybe a little bit of a fine. They don't have to say whether they're guilty or not, and everything is hunky-dory. And you mentioned MF Global hacking into their client funds. Remember, we covered that as well. An email shows that it was a hack. It literally was a hack that happened of the segregated accounts. The transfer of millions of dollars from a segregated account to JP Morgan, and it happened with approval came within a minute. The funds were deposited within 15 minutes. How is that not a hack? It is a hack, except it's done with a couple of martinis down at Harry's in Hanover uh, after work. And, you know, they decide, oh, look, we need to hack $100 million or $150 million or $3 billion. Uh, cheery, cheery, oh, chum. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, Sabu has admitted that he hacked Sony. So Sony and Anonymous are in the same headline here. PS Vita ad funds Anonymous as Atari Teenage Riot donates fee. So Sony has inadvertently found itself funding freeanons.org after banned Atari Teenage Riot agreed to one of its tracks being used in a PS Vita commercial, but donated the fee to the anonymous legal support group. So Alex Empire of Atari Teenage Riot has some history with Sony, which I'll go over in a moment, but he said he couldn't resist suggesting track Black Flags when the Japanese company came looking for music for its new Vita advertising campaign. The song contains multiple references to Anonymous and has been used in several Occupy Wall Street promotional videos. Well, yeah, they're flying the black flag. It's pirates versus uh, the old hottentots and the potentates of the copyright cartel. And uh, this is what 
needs to be supported because uh, the hacker groups, the piracy groups, they are filling the void that's been created by the legal infrastructure collapsing in the face of lobbyists who are working on behalf of monopolists at undercutting competition. Hackers and pirates are providing much needed competition for the economy to grow. Whereas the response from the central banks and the other banks is to just increase the debt load to make the economy grow. That doesn't make the economy grow, it makes the economy shrink. Hackers and pirates are the true GDP boosters. They're the ones we should celebrate in this capitalist economy. They're the heroes. Now, I wanted to turn to this blog posting from Alec Empire of Atari Teenage Riot, and he's explaining why it is that he was donating his fee to protecting and defending anonymous um, operatives who were arrested. He said, my name is Alec Empire, and I am from Atari Teenage Riot. If you are new to my music or me as a person, you might not know that I had some beef with Sony in the year 1999 over a camcorder advert in Southeast Asia. A track of mine was basically used against my permission. If you ever tried to fight a corporation like this in court in, in another country, let me tell you, you want to do other stuff with that time and money. Even though the thing got settled in court, kind of, I never felt they paid what they owed. So Sony Corporation was able to hack this man's music, take his stuff, and use it on an advertisement, and then he had to go through all the huge costs and emotional turmoil of trying to take them to court. And yet, had he done the same to them as Sabu did, Atari Teenage Riot, Alec Empire would be facing 122 years in prison. Right, and what you hear from the Sony Corporation and other in the copyright cartel is that they're for artists, they're for the music, they want to help these people. But in fact, now the artists realize that they're not helping them. They're helping to destroy them. And now they're fighting back using the tools of hacking, piracy, and the online digital revolutionary tools to fight back against these pernicious, ugly monopolists, cartel purveyors like Sony and others in the industry. And they're not helping artists. They're anti-artists. Sony hates artists. Let's get that clear. Hollywood hates artists unless they're able to exploit them and take all their frickin' money without giving them anything in return. Now, we're going to turn to a band fighting back against these toll booth operators who are using them as propaganda to try to tell the world that we need these onerous copyright laws and we need the feds chasing down people around the world in order to defend the young artist, right? Band tells fans to boycott its albums, saying its label doesn't pay. This is Streetlight Manifesto. Their music is awesome. They're going to be on the Kaiser Report soon. And they said, we're writing today to ask you to please boycott all Streetlight related items by not purchasing any of our records or merchandise from Victory's website, Victory Records, any traditional CD stores, online third-party retailers, or any digital distribution service like iTunes, Amazon, etc." Victory has a long-time reputation of pocketing all of the proceeds from a band's music and merchandise with shady accounting and generally bullish behavior. If you want to support Streetlight, our music, and our ability to tour and continue to release music, please make all SM-related purchases from our own web store, the Risk Store, R-I-S-C store.com or come out to a show and buy a shirt or CD from us directly. Right. Streetlight Manifesto realizes that they're fighting a copyright blockade. They're artists. They want to get paid. But the copyright blockade, the copyright cartel, is making that impossible. So they're going to go around the blockade. And we should support all of these bands and all these artists to totally destroy the copyright cartel. Copyright law, as it's currently iterated, a lifetime plus 70 years is immoral and it's completely economically unfeasible. And these people, these bands, these artists are going to take down the copyright cartel. We totally support this. And just as Alec Empire of Atari Teenage Riot was when he was confronted by people who said, oh, you're just doing this in order to sell more CDs. He said, no, I'm not. Here's a link to the BitTorrent of my song if you want to go download it, okay? And the same with Streetlight Manifesto. They end, speaking a bit metaphorically, there is a torrent of methods to accomplish listening to our music. And Google is your always loyal friend. Right, the torrent market, and you know, we talked about Louis C.K. is an artist in New York, a comedian who put his concert up on a torrent for free download and asked for people to donate. And he, he raised over a million dollars because there's a huge pool of capital out there, what's called crowdfunding, uh, which allows people to help 
get around this copyright blockade being set up by the MPAA, RIAA friendly stooges in Los Angeles and Washington. Now, again, speaking of authors, here's a story. We're also going to be speaking to some of the people involved in this. Authors strike back against PayPal's censorship of Smashwords. So Smashwords is an online ebook retailer, and they basically allow anybody to upload their own content and sell their books. Now, there's a section of erotica, which you know might not be in everybody's you know, they might think it's a bit too racy or whatever. But Smashwords, in an email to the subscribers, explained that PayPal has asked them to take down 2,000 titles from the erotica section. And they said, we believe it's wrong for credit card companies, banks, and other financial institutions to censor legal fiction. We believe the censorship is targeting a small subset of erotica fiction. The same censored themes are prevalent in much mainstream fiction. We believe it would be unfair to authors and readers alike for any organization to censor what writers are allowed to imagine and what readers are allowed to read. If the PayPal restrictions were taken to the extreme, Many mainstream classics, including Lolita or Gone with the Wind, could technically be banned. Even the Bible could fall under the net since it contains scenes of rape and incest. Right. Remember, PayPal was one of the first to jump in on the WikiLeaks blockade, which shut down funding for WikiLeaks and shut down a major voice of independent voice, uh, freedom of the press. And this was unbelievably... Um, immoral and completely outside of their mandate as a corporation. And now they've extended it to just cherry pick items that they like. They don't like this. It's erotica. Next thing they'll be saying, well, this author, you know, we don't like the, his syntax. You know, we'll get Frank Rich from the New York Times to review the books. He doesn't like it, so we're not going to be able to pay the paper. This is why alternative currencies like Bitcoin are on the rise because again, it's a way to do a workaround around the blockade by this fascist PayPal nonsense. And I want to get cut to the final hacking story here. Goldman's secret Greece loan shows two sinners as client unravels. Uh, Greece's secret loan from Goldman Sachs was a costly mistake from the start. On the day the 2001 deal was struck, the government of Greece owed the bank about 600 million euros more than that 2.8 billion euros it borrowed. By then, the price of the transaction, a derivative debt disguised the loan, and that Goldman Sachs persuaded Greece not to test with competitors had almost doubled to 5.1 billion euros. Right, so Greece blew up 25% of Greek GDP in one day. And one day, it, it, was, it accounted for 12% of Goldman Sachs' profits that year. Right. This was Grace's 9-11, the day they met Goldman Sachs. It, it was them hacking the sovereignty and the future of a nation of Greece. Penalties? No. Martinis? Yes. Stacey Herbert, thanks for much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Don't go away. Much more coming away, so stay right there. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to go to New York City and speak with journalist uh, Terry Boole of TerryBool.com. Terry is crowdfunding her next big piece of investigative journalism. Terry Boole, welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Hi, Max. It's great to be here. All right, Terry Boole, you're a journalist who has published in many major publications in America, and your latest piece is being crowdfunded. Why? You know, Max, I decided that it was time to ask the readers what they wanted to see and pay for. Um, this is my first time to try to crowdfund a story, and it's been an amazing success. Uh, I have the chance to choose my own editing style and the way that we're going to present this story based on reader feedback. So we're going to focus on a new Canaan trader who was once um, banned by the SEC and the CFTC who's now doing some maybe shady operations overseas. And we're going to look at how that money, we're talking millions, lots and lots of millions, how that money is funding his alternate sex life. OK, so the title of the piece is Swinging in New Canaan. And it goes by the symbol swing. And it's on piratemyfilm.com if people want to help participate in crowdfunding your piece. So get into some of the particulars here. Um, it sounds pretty sexy. <laughs> Let's just say when I tell anyone about this story that they just want to hear more. Um, you know, this, this story first started, though, when Mitch Vasquez, the new Canaan trader, 
uh, went and turned in his personal assistant, his Go Friday gal, right, for stealing $170,000 from him. Uh, she was arrested. She, she's currently charged on some felony charges. Uh, but but when, when she got caught, she told the New Canaan police that, you know, he was actually paying her to have sex with him and his living girlfriend, Pamela Chiasi. Pamela is a sister of famed inside trader who's now in jail, Daniela Chiasi. So, you know, when we first saw this story and it was reported, I, I think the headline was like sex and checks, right? And I noticed that there was probably something a little off about the trader story. Um, so right now what we're looking at is who's telling the truth? Did she really steal? Was he paying her for sex for threesomes and, you know, he just doesn't want to admit it? I mean, wh what else is going on here and, and how is money used? Is he lying to the New Canaan police? Um, this story was highlighted by John Carney at CNBC NetNet. Uh, in early January, we I had, I don't know, 50,000 unique viewers read it within the first 24 hours. And from there, it snowballed. More people just kept reaching out to me within the community. People who had sued Mitch Vasquez overseas, especially in Belize, because they believed that as a client of his trading operation, GCI Trading, that they, they've lost. They've lost thousands of dollars. Um, there's ex-assistants who have come to me. Um, it, political leaders in the town of New Canaan are reaching out and talking about the situation. And, and we looked into, you know, what's really happening here? How long has this been going on? How long has this bedroom, Wall Street, wealthy community been having a very active swing life? Right, let's put this into context here because people assume that all of the chicanery in the financial markets and banks occurs on Wall Street. What people don't understand is that actually Wall Street, for the most part, are order takers. The real movers and shakers are the hedge fund guys in Greenwich, Connecticut, in New Canaan, in this hedge fund community. So this is why I think it's important for people to understand that these hedge fund guys uh, when they're not ransacking Greece, when they're not destroying the American economy, when they're not destroying municipalities, when they're not, you know, acting outside of the law, stealing money from customers at MF Global, they're out there in Canaan, New Canaan, Connecticut, ordering threesomes, having orgies, you know, living it up like Rome or something like this. Tell us about uh, you've been uh, your investigation now. The subject of your investigation has tried to silence you. Correct? How have they done this? You know, you're right. Um at the end of January, Max, Mitch Vasquez hired a famed Greenwich lawyer. His name is Mark Sherman. His father used to represent the mob. Unfortunately, his dad also pled guilty to tax evasion. He, he just didn't pay a million dollars in taxes. So, so he hires this kind of, you know, in between the gray lines attorney. And they sue me and CNBC for defamation. Um, they did something else really rare in a legal move. They did something called a temporary injunction. And the goal there was that Mr. Vasquez thought he could just stop me from writing anything else about him while this case, which will, will, it'll take months to litigate, is moving forward. They also tried to get his, to take his names out of the story in something called a Google tag so he wouldn't come up in a search. And I mean, it's all right, just it goes to like the foundations of free speech to stop speech before speech has ever been decided that the speech isn't okay. Um, what I did is called the Harvard Digital Media Law Center. They jumped right in immediately. They were wonderful. It, it did take about two weeks, but they found me a, a top lawyer, pro bono, which means for free, to represent me. Uh, the lawyer, Carol Head, is from Bingham, and she also helped to represent the Boston Globe. Uh, when Mitch and his attorney, Mark Sherman, found out that I had this top lawyer, the day before the hearing for the temporary injunction, they pulled it. They ran away. Uh, they're still suing me and CNBC for defamation, which is interesting. Uh, we, we deny all claims. I don't think anything I wrote is libelous, considering Mitch himself admitted to the charges that the CFTC, right, the, the currency and commodities regulator, and the SEC, right, a securities and a stock regulator, who both banned him for five years. He's admitted to these charges, but he's upset I wrote about it. I, I think he's really worried about what's coming next. I think he's worried about the current Forex business that he's operating in somewhat third world countries, preying on, on mob and pop investors who think they can get rich off of trading currencies with this firm while he siphons off, allegedly siphons off monies from these accounts, you know, and I, 
I, I can't tell what he's afraid of. I mean, I just keep getting more information. I mean, he's got a nasty divorce. There's drugs involved. I mean, you name it. Luckily, you know, I, I have some great, excellent legal representation. And with the help of my readers, you know, we're, we're now able to start, you know, donations coming in to help make sure that the story is going to move forward. And it is. I'm going to print this story no matter what Mitch Ma Vasquez tries to do. Right, so the harassment that you've been suffering, it sounds like very similar to the SLAP cases, S-L-A-P-P, -P, whereby powerful interests silence bloggers and critics through uh, burdening them with legal bills. It's been very effective in silencing those reporting on financial crimes. Your thoughts? Well, you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, in Connecticut, where I live, uh, the, the SLAP laws are not that strong. If this, if I had been sued in California, I likely would have had a lot more legal rights to go and sue Mitch back for a frivolous lawsuit. I'm not in that situation right now, unfortunately. Thank goodness, though, um, since, I, since I have pro bono and free legal representation, Mr. Vasquez will not be able to stop this story by burdening me with legal bills. He, he might try to scare and intimidate me. All right, now, uh, Terry, the story you're currently investigating, of course, overlaps with the story of a senior banker at Morgan Stanley from Connecticut who has just been charged with hate crimes. Tell the audience about his bizarre crime and how he relates to this swinging in New Canaan story you're working on. Well, uh, Mr. Jennings, who is a managing director, or was, he's on leave now at Morgan Stanley. Um, in December, he got a, a cab ride home from New York, and he didn't think that he should pay the fare that the cab driver told him that he needed to pay. And according to the police reports, he started to slur an enormous amount of, of, of racial, angry words at him. Uh, the cab driver drove off, tried to go find a cop, and allegedly, Mr. Mr. Jennings went to stab him almost in the neck. It's unclear. He put his hand up and he, and he cut his hand. It's all stabbed up. So there was assault, there's larceny charges, and there's, there's somewhat of a hate crime angle here. Um, Jennings, it's interesting, you know, he, he lives down the street here from us, maybe five minutes away from Mitch Vasquez's house. He chose an attorney who I understand is his next door neighbor, Gene Riccio, who is from what, from my investigation, is actually part of Mitch Vasquez's swing scene. In fact, he re recently married, uh, maybe like a year ago, maybe 2010, he married Mitch's ex-assistant. Mitch's ex-assistants, from what we understand, besides cleaning the fish tank and walking the dog and doing his Go Friday errands, are also allegedly paid to have sex with him his guest, uh, his girlfriend, Pamela Chiasi, it's amazing. Uh, Terry, it's just come out that the major prostitution ring has been broken up in Manhattan, and apparently uh, senior bankers are involved in paying for sex for minors. Have you been tracking that story at all? Does it relate to swinging in New Canaan, the project you're working on now? You know, I did, I did see that come across my radar. So far in this story, uh, we do not have any situation um, with minors involved in the in the swing scene, um, what I what we are seeing, and you know, I don't want to give away everything of this amazing story that's going to come out, but there are questions about some of the adult participants if they are um, if they are being drugged or if they're of sound mind when they're involved in his parties, so that he tries to manipulate them to get them to participate. Yeah, well, you look at some of the clients of these firms like Greece, the client of Goldman Sachs, you wonder whether Goldman Sachs drugged them before they took on some of these onerous products that <laughs> totally bankrupted the country. Now, finally, we've got about a minute left, Terry. You're uh, an investigative journalist. You're, you're right in the belly of the beast up there in the hedge fund community in Greenwich and uh, New Canaan, where really the, the, the movers and shakers of, of, of the global economic crisis live and breathe. They're involved in scandalous uh, sex capades that you're covering. It's quite a, a testament to the moral depravity uh, of the characters involved. Right. So now crowdfunding, the project is swinging in New Canaan. It's on piratemyfilm.com. It's more than two thirds funded already on the exchange. It happened within a few days, a testament to your pull, your drawing power out there in the journalistic community. Do you think Thank crowdfunding you. will has the potential to, to change the way investigative journalism is funded? I hope so, Max. I, I, I mean, right now, what we raised $2,000 in the matter of three days. We need $1,000 more. 
Uh, because, because of the money that we raised really fast, I was able to get Nick Verbitsky of Blue Chip Films, who's the director of the Bear Stearns movie called Confidence Game. He signed on. He's excited about it. And I, I think we're going to be able to blow up in a story like I've never been able to write at The Atlantic or New York Magazine or Fortune at Forbes, any of the publications that I've written for. I think this is going to be visual, detailed, and it's, it's going to change the way that we look at, you know, how can we get news out that is truthful and interesting to our readers. Fantastic. All right, we're out of time. Terry Bull, journalist at terrybull.com. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Bye-bye, Max. All right, and that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Terry Bull of terrybull.com. If you want to reserve shares on your new project swinging in New Canaan, check out piratemyfilm.com. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all. <laughs>